Now, what we're doing this Christmas is we're taking this theme of the big give and we're turning it into a little uh, sermon series. Because Christmas is not just about what we can give, but it's primarily about what God has given us through Jesus Christ. Now, we're all very familiar with the Christmas story. When Christmas comes around, what comes to mind are the sheep and the shepherds and the singing angels and the stars and the manger scene and the swaddling cloths. You know, I didn't know what swaddling cloths were until we had our little daughter. I was like, swaddling cloths? It's cloths with with which you swaddle babies. But you, you learn things at different points in life. But we're so familiar with this Christmas story involving wise men and camels that we, if we're not careful, we can miss the meaning of Christmas, the significance of Christmas. I mean, did God send Jesus Christ just to give us a very nostalgic story that we can feel the warm and fuzzies every year when Christmas comes around? No, He was doing something far more significant with the Christmas story. So what we need to do is we need to pull back this familiarity and we need to remind ourselves once again what the significance is of Jesus Christ coming to earth in human form and living the life that he lived. So in a very ironic twist, we are going to try and uh, do away with familiarity by looking at the most familiar verse in the Bible. (laughs) So if you have your Bibles with me, you can turn to John chapter 3. And we're going to read John 3.16. When's the last time you heard a sermon that was just based on John 3.16? We've all heard this, you know, whether or not you uh, grew up going to church, this is the most famous scripture in the entire Christian faith. And the reason is that each word is so pregnant with meaning that it's amazing and it really captures the heart of the Christian faith. So let's go ahead and read this and then we're going to pray and we're going to get stuck in. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask for His guidance in it. God, we thank You so much for this time of year where we get to reacquaint ourselves with the significance and the meaning of of Jesus coming to earth. God, we thank you for the gift that Jesus is, that in giving your son, you gave us something more extraordinary than any other gift we could have ever received. God, would you help us by your Holy Spirit to see um, the meaning of Christmas with new insight and with new clarity this morning. Help us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're talking about love. Now, it seems like the most basic thing in the world. Yes, love. That, that, that word that we use for so many things. You know, the, the Beatles told, told us that all you need is love. You know, the band foreigner really wanted to know what love is. You know, right? Now, but apparently, love is quoted as, you know, the meaning of life. That life really means love. And it's, and it's this word we use to give incredible meaning And apparently, love is the meaning of Christmas. We just read, for God so loved the world. And that's the reason that Jesus came into the world, was to show us the love of God. Now, the reason we can't just pack up our Bibles and go home, because that's (laughs) love, this word presents us with another problem. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was preparing my proposal to my wife, I really wanted to, to... you know, give that moment of meaning and significance. And this is like one of the most important things I'll ever do in my life. How do I make sure that this is a moment to remember? So as I was writing, you know, down what I was going to say, it should surprise none of you that I had a plan for what I was going to say. Um, I always have a plan for everything. And I thought, well, you, you know what? I can't think of anything more significant than for that to be the first time to say, I love you. So think about this. I use this word love to give one of these most important moments in my life significance. And I'm pretty sure last week I said I love pizza. (laughs) 
So what is it about this word love? Apparently you can love your spouse and pizza and the Batman movies, like all in the same paragraph. Love is something that you can fall into and apparently fall out of. Love is something that, you know, apparently if children are deprived of it, it has a significant effect on their lives. But what kind of love are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, for for God so loved the world like he loves pizza just much more? What is the nature of this love that is being described here in this very famous passage? And the reason that this is so important to understand is that if we think, like if we attribute that kind of love, the pizza kind of love, to God, when we hear this scripture, it's a take it or leave it kind of scripture. But if we understand the profound difference of the kind of love that God has for the world, then it will strike us. And I believe that when we understand the kind of love that God has for the world and for us, that it won't just be something that's intellectual, yes, God loves me, but it will be an experience that you can enter into. So what kind of love is this that we're talking about? Well, this is the perfect scripture um, for our purposes because we read, for God so loved the world. And if we pause there, we can take this in a couple different ways. You know, for God so loved the world. Like, I so love you, man. But God is not a hippie from the 70s. You know, we read that and we think, oh, this must mean God loved the world so much. But no, when John uses this phrasing, It's not talking about how much God loves the world. It's communicating the way in which God loved the world. You can take that off, Chris. I'm not not there yet, dude. Um, This is describing to us that God, this is saying, in this way, God loved us. So this is describing the very nature of the love that God has for us. And here's what we're going to discover, that it's different than we think it is but it's better than we ever imagined. It's different than we think it is. It's not your pizza kind of love. It's not your Batman movies kind of love. This is an entirely different kind of love that we're not used to. But it's better, and because it's different, it's better than we ever imagined. So in what ways is this different? Well, if we start off, for God, okay, pause right there. This seems like the most normal thing for us to say. God is love, God loves, but if you would have you know, rewound to, to this day and age, there are two kind of original audiences. You have the Jewish Christians, and in fact, Jesus in this paragraph is speaking to Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, and for 400 years, God has not spoken to the nation of Israel through the prophets, and they're under the boot of the Roman Empire, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, yeah, God loves the world. What is Nicodemus thinking? Like, really? <laughs> Does God know what's going on in the world? You see, it's different. We'll often equate love with God must intervene in every way that I think that He should intervene. And then you had the other, the the uh, the Greek. Christians, so the Gentiles, the non-Jewish Christians, and they grew up with a religious mentality where God, gods didn't love human beings. Gods created human beings to do their, you know, slave labor. And if there was love involved, it was like really warped, really weird kind of love. But for the first century people to hear God loves the world, it was radical. And I think it's radical for us in this way. We often think of God's love as being merited, that life is like an audition, that if you do well and if you, know, you come to the end of your life and God gives you a double thumbs up, then you get His love. But this word love means that in the moment, like now, not one day, God has a heart posture of affection toward the world. Here's how I think we can understand this. Um, have you ever gotten this question, maybe about a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a spouse or even a good friend, like, why do you love so-and-so? If, if somebody were to ask me, why do you love your wife? There's only one right answer. Yes. <laughs> because 
Love is not something that happens because of these different facets. Love is there. And these different facets are almost like an expression of that love. And yet we treat God as if His love is something that can be earned. But what this tells us is that God has this heart posture of loving affection toward the world. Not because of what they've done, but He just does. If somebody were to ask God, why do you love the world? Yes. But do we view God like that? Or is God in our mind somebody who uses love as manipulation to get us to do what He wants us to do? I'd I'd argue that we think that more often than we even realize. We read, God loves the world. And we think, well, it's not really that he feels affection for the world. It's that it's, it's like tough love. He loves the world in a tough love kind of way. And saying, I love you, so you better. I think we view God like that a lot of the time. But no, God loves. God has affection for the world. You see, it's different than we, than we expect. Now, here's the other reason it's different. When we read, for God so loved the world, we read the world. And what, what do we view? Green planet, you know, like we're, we're out uh, like those pictures from space shuttles where oh, it's beautiful globe, so good, you know, God so loved the world. And we think of, it's like the vastness, like, whoa, seven billion people God loves. But whenever John uses this phrase, the world, it's actually emphasizing the ways in which humanity rebels against God. This, this phrase, the world, has very bad connotations whenever John uses it. Uh, to help us understand this, D.A. Carson, in his great little book called The Difficult Doctrine of Love, has this quote. You can shoot that up there, Chris. In John's vocabulary, world is primarily the moral order in willful and culpable rebellion against God. In John 3.16 our verse, God's love in sending the Lord Jesus is to be admired, not because it is extended to so big a thing as the world, but to so bad a thing. Not so many people as to such wicked people. That is quite the quote. I hope this makes you see the scripture in a new light. For God had loving affection for the world. Sinful, rebellious, culpable world. For it, a, a world steeped in sin and a heart posture of rebellion and rejection toward God. How does God feel about them? He loves them. He loves us. Here's why I think this is so important. Isn't it true that we will often hide details from our past or embarrassing experiences from the ones we love for fear of losing their love? And yet, it is a desire of ours to be truly known and yet truly loved. This is the love that God has for us. He knows every dark corner of our hearts. He knows every regret we've ever had. He knows the things that nobody else knows about us, things we'd rather not bring up in any conversation. He knows the good, the bad, and the real ugly. And He says, I love you. Isn't that the kind of love that we want? Love that isn't merited on our behavior? Because the truth is that we've all done things in our life that we think truly should disqualify us from God's love. But this kind of love is a different kind of love. And it is love that means we are truly known and truly loved. How else is it different than we expect? We read, for God so loved the world that he gave. All right, pause there. In American culture, we primarily think of love in emotional terms, that love is something you feel towards somebody else. Apparently, God's love is different. That God's love, yes, is an emotion. He has affection in his heart towards people, but he acts. For God, love can't just remain a feeling, 
but he is going to do something about it. How much more powerful is that love than a love that simply remains an emotion? And right here is when we have to transition to talking about how it's better than we imagined. It's better than we imagined because God's love for us didn't just remain an emotion. Have you seen this in the movies and TV shows where somebody will say, you know, I love you, but they don't do anything about it. It's like, well, that love is entirely, that love only benefits one party in the situation. The person gets an emotional feeling of love, but the, but the person, you know, if nobody acts on, on that feeling of love, then there's no shared experience of love. Here's why the love of God is better than we imagine, that God acts in His love. His love is not simply a feeling. The Bible calls the, His form of love covenant love. Now, here's a question. We are familiar kind of with, you know, this is, this is like an old-style word, covenant. Um, but we're familiar with a certain kind of covenant in our day, day and age, and it's marriage. That marriage is making a covenant where you're saying, I basically pledge my life to you. I give my life to you in the form of marriage. Unless you do a prenup, then it's like, I kind of give my life to you-ish, right? But God's kind of love, covenant love, is saying, you know what? I give myself to you entirely because I love you. Isn't that so much better than love that just remains an emotion? It is God's nature to give himself to you. Now, what does that mean, God giving himself to you? How does an immaterial God give himself to you? Well, look, his love is an invitation. We read, he gave his only son so that those who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Once again, we have to to, um, take our familiarity with this verse because when we hear eternal life, we think of eternal life as life that just goes on and on and on and on. But when John writes about eternal life, it's a far bigger concept. He's talking about the life, the divine life, the life uh, that God created as He intended it, life that is life to the full, as some of the older translations translate it, life to the full. So it's not just life in perpetuity, but it's this divine invitation to participate in the fellowship that God experiences within Himself. Now, what I mean by that is God from eternity past uh, is expressed eternally in three persons called the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God had fellowship within Himself, and He created humans to participate in that divine fellowship. Do you realize that this is God's love? He doesn't just feel emotional affection for you, though He does, which is extraordinary in and of itself. But it's an invitation to live in loving relationship with Him for eternity. And that is at the core of what it really means to be human. That is the purpose for which God created humans, to fellowship with Him for eternity. And God's love accomplishes that. But the reason I think it's better than we can imagine, most of all, is because it is costly. We read that God so loved the world that He gave. And what did He give? His only Son. Here's a story that I think illustrates that. Um, When my siblings and I were teenagers... We were living in Johannesburg at the time, and my dad was working for a church that was a, it, it was a good church, it was fine, um, but they didn't have much of an emphasis on providing a discipleship environment for teenagers. Like, the youth group was kind of an afterthought, be like, yeah, put those kids somewhere in the back. And my dad recognized that we were growing more and more disinterested with following Jesus, and he knew that if that which is most important in life, following Jesus, is going to be a thing for his kids, he was going to have to change the environment. So he went and he met with this pastor, 
And this was a very big church, okay? So that will help you understand how this pastor was able to do what he was able to do. But he slid a piece of paper across the desk and put a pen there. And he said, okay, Greg, write down a number that will keep you here. He gave him a blank check. He said, write down a salary number that will keep you here. <laughs> How many zeros will fit on this page? Um, and my dad said, thank you, but no. My kids and their relationship with Jesus is more important. Now, when I heard that, I was older at the time, I felt loved by my dad in a huge way because of what he was willing to give up, because of the costly nature of his love. How much more can we feel loved by God because of the costly nature of what he was willing to give up? Jesus Christ came to earth, lived a perfect life, the perfect contrast to the world and that which is in rebellion against God, yet he became a substitute for the world, and when he's on the cross, what does he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father lost his son. The son lost the divine fellowship. And why did he do it? So that you and I might once again gain access to the divine life that God wants for us. Is there any more profound expression of love in the universe. No, this is the nature of the love of God. So, there's so many different stories in this room. I don't know where this falls for you. Maybe for you, the fact that this is an invitation from God. He says, whoever believes in Jesus will never perish but have everlasting life. You've never accepted that invitation by putting your faith in Jesus. Maybe that's the action point for you, to finally accept that invitation to, to go to your group leader or to come to me and say, you know what? I've never put my faith in Jesus and accepted the invitation of God's love. For some of us, maybe the application is entering into an experience of God's love. It not just being a mental category, but it being something that we truly experience. And here's what I mean. Like, in moments where you can encounter the love of God, be it in worship, be it through the study of His Scriptures, be it in prayer, are you showing up expecting to, to experience God's love? Because I know we, we can go through those things and we can just do them as duty. And yes, I know God needs to, you know, I need to be a good Christian. I need to read this. Or... Do we show up and say, God, I want to experience you. You have invited me into eternal life, divine fellowship with God. I want to experience that. I believe that that prayer and that desire honors God and that you can experience the love of God every single day. But we need to show up. We need to have a heart posture of God loves me so much that He extended an invitation to me, not just to um, have some religious badge, not just some get-out-of-jail-free card so when I die I go to heaven, but to participate in the divine life here and now. We need to show up and expect God to encounter us with His love. For some of us, we look to so many other things to fill that place that only love can fill in our lives. And you know what? Some good things, we, we try to fill that with some good things. Some, some, sometimes I feel like my life is a, a bucket that is like a shovel of, of love. And when I'm feeling loved, that's when I make my best choices, my best decisions. That's when my actions are have the best kind of posture. And when it's empty, when I don't feel loved, when I don't feel like I'm getting the affirmation from the people I need to get that affirmation from. I just, I go haywire. It's like lines in my brain get crossed. And I hate it because I like to consider myself a self-reliant, independent person. Now, here I am. I'm like, man, I am so dependent on love. 
Do you realize that God wants to give you the kind of love that means your bucket is always full? But often we look to other things to fill that bucket. Maybe good things. Yes, the love of family is great. The love of friends is great. The, the love of people who affirm you maybe in work or, um, or in the classroom is great. But nothing will take the place of the love of God in your life. Nothing can fill that void. And maybe you've been looking. Maybe you felt like you've had an empty bucket of love for months or years. The invitation is to come and go before God and ask Him and say, God, I'm empty. I need you to fill me up. I've been looking for love everywhere else except in your presence. So as we come to the, to the bread and the cup this morning, I don't know what you need to do. I don't know what the action step is for you. Maybe it's a rethinking about God's love. Maybe it's just asking God to fill you up. Maybe it's accepting that invitation for the first time. But whatever you need to do as we take the bread and the cup and as we worship, God invites you to enter into an experience of His love because He loved you so much that He gave up what is most costly to Him to have you with Him. This is the love of God given for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love. Love that was so costly, we can barely fathom it. But God, love that is an invitation to all those who would accept it through Jesus Christ. Thank you for not leaving us alone and vulnerable. Thank you for loving the world, that which is dark and broken and alienated from you. You loved us when we didn't have an ounce of love for you, and you came in Jesus Christ to show us your great love. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. God, we want to come to you and have an experience of your love that we might live in your love, find ourselves in your love, find our sufficiency in your love. God, for, for my friends in this room who might be making this decision for the first time, I pray for the courage and the illumination to do that. God, for my brothers and sisters who feel empty and dry, God, would you fill us up? God, even in this Christmas season, may we make time to enter into an experience of your love and ask you to fill us up. I pray that we would have a profound revelation of the love that you have for us, that it's far greater than our somewhat diluted definition of love that we often use. Thank you for your love and how significant it is. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.